Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2017 firearms auction. And today we're looking at what I would argue is the best sniping rifle of World War I. Although it just barely got in at the very end of the war, kind of like the MP18. Now, this is a pattern of 1914 Mark I W or, or WF or WT, we'll get to the distinction between those two a little later on, uh, rifle. And so it's a, a pattern of 1914 rifle, which is very much different than the number one Mark III SMLE that the British used in very large numbers during the war. Uh, in 1915, when trench warfare really was getting going, the Germans had a distinct superiority in terms of sniping. They had better equipment, they had better trained guys, and just doctrinally they were more willing to engage in it. Uh, this left the British a bit unhappy, and the British set about developing their own sniper program, and by the middle of 1916 they had done so very effectively, and arguably by that point the British had the upper hand and the Germans would never really get it back. The British started doing a number of things really well. They were working in two-man groups, uh, sniper and spotter teams, a technique that we would we continue to use to this day. They equipped their teams with actual telescopes uh, or spotting scopes instead of just field binoculars. The Germans tended to just use binoculars. The British observational equipment was more effective. It made it easier for them to spot targets. But the British didn't really have, well they didn't at all, have a sniper rifle in inventory at the beginning of the war. So when they decided that they wanted to pursue sniping on a, an institutional scale, they had to come up with the gear. And so what they initially did in 1915 was purchase almost 3,000 telescopic sights off the commercial market. These comprised a wide variety of different brands and makes and models and magnifications. Just they bought up literally almost everything they could find in the British Isles to mount on rifles. And then they proceeded to develop a mount, or a series of mounts, there are a bunch of different variations, for the number one Mark III, the SMLE, the Lee Enfield rifle. And unfortunately, someone in a position of authority had the bright idea to offset the scope to the left of the bore. Now, Theoretically, I assume, the idea, the rationale for this was so that you could continue to use stripper clips and load the rifles quickly. However, for a sniper that's not really that important of a thing. Um, you'll see, for example, the Germans center mounted scopes on their Mausers, despite the fact that that prevented them from using uh, stripper clips. That didn't matter. A sniper can just load a couple rounds at a time. And having the scopes offset created a lot of problems for the actual snipers. Uh, on the one hand, you know, the, uh, at just a very fundamental level, if the scope's not centered over the bore, you're going to have a, a variation in your windage as the range changes. So the most common thing apparently for British snipers with those scopes to do was to actually zero the rifles with a couple inches of offset, so that they knew they would hit, say, two inches to the left at any given range, and then they could just hold off. The alternative to that is if you zero it so that you actually hit directly on target, at one specific range, you're going to hit to the left uh, at any shorter range, and you're going to hit to the right at any greater range, and that makes for all sorts of range estimation issues. Uh, one of the other problems that was the result of these side-mounted scopes is something pretty specific to World War I. <laughs> Although actually in a weird way it kind of applies to some of today's competition shooting even. Uh, and that is they had these steel loophole plates that they called them, basically protective shields with a, a little small hole in the middle that you could observe or shoot through. Well, the hole was the size of the front end of a rifle. And if you had an SMLE with a side-mounted scope, if you put the muzzle through the hole, your scope was set off to the side and all you got was a very up-close view of the steel plate that you were hiding behind. Uh, so they had to work around that. Now, by 1918, a lot of these issues had been realized. Um, in fact, before 1918, the British had set up sniping schools. They were starting to really get some institutional expertise. And they, they finally, in actually in 1917, uh, came up with a, a specific rifle designed for the snipers. And it was based on the pattern 1914. This was deemed to be a much better rifle than the SMLE for sniping for a couple reasons. Um, it had front locking lugs. The SMLE has rear locking lugs, which were considered more reliable. Front lugs are more accurate. 
the receiver of the SMLE was considered too flimsy or too flexible when it came to mounting a scope, because it hadn't been designed with that in mind, and cludging a scope mount on the side wasn't that great of a solution. And the barrel was deemed to be too lightweight to make for an appropriate effective sniping rifle. Uh, on the other hand, the pattern of 1914 rifle addressed a lot of these issues. This rifle had originally been designed for a substantially more powerful cartridge, the 276 Enfield cartridge, uh, prior in 1913, and so it was kind of overbuilt for 303. This meant the receiver was well suited to mounting a scope on, because it was already heavier than it needed to be. The barrels on these rifles were heavier than those of the SMLE, uh, and just in general it was a more accurate and higher quality rifle. Uh, particularly the ones made by Winchester. I should point out, all of the pattern 1914 guns were made under contract in the United States by a couple different countries, uh, Eddystone, Remington, and Winchester. The British particularly liked the Winchester production, and when I said that this was a 1914 Mark I W, that W specifically indicates that it was Winchester production. When this rifle was originally developed for the snipers, what's interesting is it didn't actually use a scope. Uh, the initial version of the Precision Sniper's rifle based on the 1914 pattern uh, actually had a fine adjust peep sight. The British really liked the aperture sight on this pattern 1914 rifle. The only problem with it, and the reason why it was rejected as a precision rifle earlier in the war, was that the elevation adjustment options uh, were too coarse. It just had... You, you had adjustments for hundreds of yards and that was it. What they developed on this was a finely adjustable sight that actually had one MOA increments in a really cool little mechanism that I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, later on, that was adopted in November of 1917, in April of 1918, this 1918 pattern scope was formally adopted, and the British government ordered 2,000 of these complete scoped sniper rifle packages to be built. However, by November, when the war ended, only a, just only a few of these had actually made it into frontline combat use. So I would say it's definitely the best setup sniper rifle of the war. The 1914, or in US service, the model of 1917, uh, rifle is the best bolt action rifle of World War I. This scope is durable, it, it fits well, uh, it just kind of does everything right in a way that a lot of the hodgepodged commercial scope setups for that were used earlier in the war really didn't. Um, however, just barely in use at the end of the war. Now, that being said, this did serve as the standard British sniper rifle after the war. Um, in the early 1920s, when the British went through and kind of assessed their needs for sniper rifles and what they had in inventory, they realized that they had a, a bunch of these that were standardized and effective and very nice, and then they had just a wild mix of components and mounting types of uh, SMLEs. So what they ended up doing in the 1920s was scrapping the SMLE snipers, you know, tearing them down, putting the rifles back into service, surplusing the scopes and standardizing on this pattern of gun going forward. They decided they needed about 3,000 of them, so that's what they kept in inventory. Those brass fittings just look really awesome, don't they? A uh, couple things we can look at here on the side. We have the rifle serial number right here, W241879, typically on a uh, 1914 or 1917 rifle. That would be located on the top of the receiver, but of course the top of the receiver on this one has a big old scope mount bolted to it. So the serial number was remarked here on the side where it would be visible. That same serial number is of course also on the bolt handle there. And when the rifle was assembled by BSA, that uh, number was also marked on the scope. There's your broad arrow British property mark as well as proof mark on the side of the receiver. The scope mount that was chosen for this is a detachable type. That was actually very common during World War I. Um, it was pretty typical for guys to, for snipers, to carry the scopes uh, in a separate uh, pouch or carrying case to protect them, and then you'd mount the scope when you needed it. So to remove this, we're going to flip this lever 180 degrees open, and then the scope lifts out the back and has two claws in the front that fit into this mount. So the scope comes off very nice and easily. We'll take a closer look at the scope in just a moment. But first, I want to show you the rear sight, because this is the fine adjust precision rear sight that was first adopted by the British uh, in 1917 as a sniper's weapon. This little knob is your fine elevation adjustment, and you can see that there are three little lines marked on it. 
rotating one line's width, or a third of a revolution, is a one minute of angle change. And that was, that was very specifically and very deliberately done. And that's one of the few instances of a really kind of a modern uh, amount, a modern level of precision in a World War I era sniper rifle. Um, it was much more common to have a bullet drop compensator built into the scope so that you'd have adjustments only by raw range. The British recognized that finding, fine adjustment like this really didn't matter. Uh, and so that's what they developed for a precision iron sighted rifle. Really pretty cool. To put this in context, uh, when accepted into military service, this rifle and scope combination was expected to be mechanically capable of one and a half minute of angle, meaning a, uh, a one and a half inch group at 100 yards. Uh, now the snipers themselves, in actual practical fire, were expected to be able to make a three minute of angle group, so a three inch group at 100 yards. That's a level of accuracy that a lot of people today would just scoff at. However, Shooting a 3-inch group at 100 yards from field conditions with a World War I rifle is a lot more difficult than I think a lot of people uh, give it credit for. And, and I think it's valuable to recognize that that's what the standard of sniping was in World War I. Um, you may also look at that and go, well, geez, if they're shooting a 3-minute of angle group at 300 yards, that's a 9-inch group. At 400 yards, you're not really capable of, say, making a headshot. And that's quite true. Um, there are a number of documented uh, British sniper uh, discussing uh, or, or writing down the history of the sniping program in the, in the war, and they talked about the rifles basically being used at 300 yards and in for precise shots. And that we're talking about, uh, you know, shooting fleeting targets in the trenches that were visible, uh, shooting at enemy loopholes, that sort of thing. Uh, really within 300 is where they were shooting. The scopes were actually zeroed at 200 yards which is a range that really kind of makes perfect sense. That's even where we zero a lot of rifles to this day. Looking at the scope, this is an Aldous pattern of scope adopted as the model of 1918. It uh, offers three power magnification. It is not windage zeroable. Uh, that has to be done, or windage adjustable. It would be zeroed at the factory. And then it is elevation adjustable uh, based on this dial mechanism. So this also gives you a BDC. You can adjust this out to a thousand meters, um, and this also allows you to zero the scope to wherever it needs to be, and then you can loosen the screws and reposition the BDC dial so that it is at least reasonably accurate. Now, being one of the rifles that was assembled in the 30s, this scope has a BSA uh, crossed rifles logo on it. The wartime production ones would not have this. And they would have a marking to the something like uh, assembled or manufactured by the Parismatic Prism Company. We do have a model of 1918 mark on the back end of the tube there. This whole assembly, including the mounts, weighs in at under a pound at uh, 15 and a half ounces, uh, so a little under half a kilogram. Um, not not that heavy actually, which is a good thing because the Pattern 1914 rifle was a pretty heavy rifle to begin with. And lastly, this uh, FF in a circle uh, is a mark indicating uh, use by or possession by the Irish Free State, which is also indicative of this rifle being one of the ones manufactured in the 1930s. Which makes sense. Um, finding a completely kitted out and proper World War I era sniper rifle is a challenging proposition. Um, having one that is knowing the provenance of this batch that were built after the war uh, and then we know that they were all surplused into the U.S. really does explain um, how a rifle in such nice condition uh, can be still extant today. Now the scope here is, has its limitations. This is obviously a World War I vintage scope, uh, or World War I vintage design. You can see the crosshair there is a heavy vertical post and a fine horizontal post. This scope has a pretty uh, pretty short eye relief, so you have to have your, your head very close to the scope to see through it properly. It also has a very small eye box, uh, which means you have to have your head in just the right place in order to properly see through the scope. And if you wobble very much at all, as I kind of am with the camera here, uh, you start to lose uh, part of the sight picture. All that being said, this is still a fantastic setup for World War I. And I think any sniper in the war on either side 
would have been quite happy to have access to one of these rifles. Having shot some 1917s, as well as a bunch of SMLEs uh, and number 4 Enfields, I totally agree with the opinion of Julian Hatcher that this was the best bolt-action rifle of World War I. And with this scope set up, I think it's, it's a pretty clear, uh, clear victor for the title of best sniper rifle of World War I. If we accept it being a World War I sniper rifle, since it was just barely adopted by the end of the war. Um, this particular one is in really nice shape, which is largely explained by the fact that it's a post-war built gun, and not one that actually had to go through the war and then another hundred years of service life uh, before arriving here on this table. So, if you would like an example of the primo sniper rifle pattern of World War I, if not actually from World War I, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle. That'll have their pictures and their description and their price estimates. And if you decide you'd like it, you can place a bid on their uh, on the telephone or on their website, or come here and participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.